Well, thank you for being here, and thank you for bringing your kids. And uh, we have some notes being passed out. Now, we're, we're a little confused in that. We weren't sure what service would be having which notes. So we'll give these men a chance to pass them out, and we appreciate that. And if there aren't enough to go around, we apologize, and we'll ask you to share with the neighbor if they'd like to see it. Yeah, I, uh, I've had that experience, Daniel. One time, after what I thought was a rather moving um, communion service, I said, let's stand together and sing, let's be the tie that binds. And it went so well, I said, and let's sing that second, or that last verse. Well, no one knew the last verse, and it just killed it. Uh, this is regarding uh, Nyla Easterday. My wife is up there, as well as Tracy, and of course, Donna, Diane, East, uh, not Easterday, but Raber is down in Florida, says here that her blood pressure is high, heart rate is normal right now, and that she's still having some problems with confusion. I don't think that's about my wife, but it could be. All right, but you did not hear me say that. Yes. Oh, it's being recorded. That's bad. Yes. So what we have now is the 915 notes, but it'll fit very comfortably in this hour. And let me explain to you why things were moved around. I spoke to Rusty. It was rather late last night, about 8 o'clock or so, and I said, I've got myself in a dilemma. And here's my dilemma. I was gone this past week, and I'd like to thank Aaron for taking care of everything, making sure that all the needs were met here, and that's really great to know there's somebody here that can do that. But this week, I went down to uh, Chattanooga with my aunt, and then went to Alabama to visit her dear friend, and really had a nice time, got to watch a nephew play a couple of ball games. I had promised him, I, as I mentioned last week, and he's a senior, and it's at the end of the season, so now's the right time to go see him. I had a great time. And then uh, we got a call this week that Alan is having his wisdom teeth taken out. And one is so gnarled that they're going to have to take him to the hospital and put him under and get it out. And they say, well, you need to have somebody there for the first 24 hours. And there's a lot of stress. They're moving. His deployment is coming up. So I thought, well, I'll just run out there and be Alan's nurse. And even he agreed to it, so he must have thought it'd be a good idea. Because I am so cheap, I use one of those Internet sites where you just say the day you want to go and the day you want to come back. And then they say, we have one. Do you want it? And if you hit yes, it's your ticket. There's nothing you can do to exchange it. It's just your ticket. And they tell you after you buy it what the flight number is, where it goes, how many layovers there are. And I thought, that's no problem. Anywhere I am, you can always watch people. That's good entertainment, isn't it? And I can have my books with me. I can always study. So really good plan on the way out. I leave tomorrow about 541. We'll get out there at Seattle time at about 11. That's good. It said on the thing, you will be returning on a different day than your departure. And I thought, that's no problem. If I get in at 2 or 3 in the morning on Sunday morning, I'll be here in plenty of time. I click, yes, I want it because I'm cheap and it's $100 cheaper. And then it says, you leave Seattle at 11.05 p.m. And you will arrive by way of Atlanta at... 9.20 something on Sunday morning. So next week I should be here just in time to shake your hands on the way out. So because of the fix I got myself into, I asked Rusty if he would preach next week, the second message of his series. And then we had a different message earlier today, and I'd like to share with you this one that would come from the 9.15 service. But it's such a great theme, I know it will encourage you. Our faithful Lord. If you notice underneath there is a brief summary of the message. Because God is faithful to us, especially in times of difficulty, we should respond with faithful service to him. Now we know that's a theme that's all through the Bible. We give him our all. 
because of all that he's done for us, that's our reasonable service. That's the least that he can expect, is that we would serve him faithfully and completely. But as we all know, when we determine to do that, we will find out that it's just as difficult to be a faithful Christian as it is to be one wandering out there in the wilderness of sin. This world is filled with difficulties. It's a good thing because most of us don't grow and we don't change when everything is easy. But we learn much more when the pressure is on. Even when you are doing everything the Lord wants you to do, you can expect that there will be difficulties. And that brings us to our very first point. God's servants all go through difficult times. If I played against elementary students, I could be a star, a rather round one, but nonetheless a star. But there would be no real challenge there because that's not where you get better, not playing against little kids. You get better against playing good competition. In life, we become stronger Christians. We become more effective Christians. Yes, it does involve the, the Spirit of God working through us. It does involve our studying and applying the Scriptures. But also that hardening, that tempering that takes place is when we go through difficulties. That's why the Word of Faith movement is so dangerous. Because the Word of Faith movement would teach you this. If you learn the secrets, then there's a way to be happy all the time. There's a way to maneuver the principles of God so that you can always be wealthy, you can always be healthy, and you can always wake up with a smile because the Lord is good. Well, the Lord is good. But the Lord will allow all of his people to go through difficulties because that's where we are changed and that's where the glory of God is best displayed, is in the difficult circumstances. Point number two, and the one that we'll spend most of our time on, is this. God is faithful toward his servants. So we're stepping into the middle of a story at Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. And let's look at letter A. God is faithful to raise up godly co-workers. Now let's read the passage, then we'll come back to that point. Starting at verse eight, or chapter 18, verse 1. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now thus far, there's been a particular pattern that's been very evident. Paul goes into a, a, a Gentile city, finds those few Jews who are there. He goes to the synagogue and he teaches them that Jesus is the Messiah. And he goes through all of the prophecies. Look, all of these point to Christ. He is the Messiah. And the greatest proof is this. When he was crucified and buried, on the third day he was raised from the dead. And because he is the all-powerful King of kings and Lord of lords, he can forgive sins, he can promise eternal life, he can carry you through any set of circumstances. He is the Christ. And some of the Jews would respond, but at least thus far, historically, the majority would say, I don't like that. That's not what I've always been taught. That's not what I've always believed. And then there would be a conflict. And then Paul would leave those Jews in the synagogue, and then he would go out into the streets, and he would preach that message of salvation in Christ to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles would hear that and be so excited that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wants to be their God. And then 
Typically what would happen is the people would get agitated in the community and then there'd be something close to a riot and then Paul would either be stoned or run out of the city. So that's kind of where we are in the pattern and we find here that he's in Corinth and it's because they just ran him out of Athens. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila born in Pontus who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath, Paul, uh, each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike, and after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia. So here he is. Paul is busted. He's poor. He doesn't have any money. He comes into the city and he finds some other Jewish comrades and they are tent makers and he starts working with them. He still continues to go to the synagogue and he's teaching and he's preaching. And now even great encouragement comes, Silas and Timothy. So let's start off with letter A, go back to that. God is faithful to raise up godly co-workers. We have a number of important ministries that are happening in our church. Right now, during this school season, the, some of the most important work is being done on Wednesday nights. We have a large group of elementary kids. We have a large group of junior high, high school kids. And if you would come and interview most of those junior high and high school kids, you would find out that these kids are going through a rough time. These are not the kids who have grown up in a Christian family. These are not the kids who have been coming to church. Some, but majority, no. These are rough circumstances. A ministry like that needs co-workers. We've been blessed, you've heard us say, not by way of bragging, but by, by wanting you to know the, the awesome responsibilities we have. We have nearly 10% of the high school and elementary students coming to our church's ministries on Wednesday nights. We are always asking for co-workers, those people who would labor with us to accomplish a great thing like this. We need our teenagers and we need our young people to be involved in these ministries, to be attending these ministries, because they are co-workers by their very presence. They're there to help us do a great deed. Many of you are not able to do that anymore, but you faithfully give. And in your faithful giving, you have become co-workers in that ministry. Some of you pray. I know that when we see these good things happening, we know that there are co-workers who are praying in this ministry. Now, that's true with our missionaries. It's true with all of our, our ministries in this church. We need faithful co-workers. Oh, it's a terrible play on words, but I'll share it with you anyway. If you are in the fellowship, you know, a part of this, if you are in the fellowship, you need to pick up an oar. All right? We've all seen the, the show. It goes like this. It could be a cowboy show, it could be Indiana Jones, it could be a cartoon, but they're floating down the river because it's always easy to flow with the current. And everybody's having a good time until they see the mist boiling up on the horizon. And then they hear the, the rumble of the falls. And then normally there's the, oh no! We're headed towards the rapids or the falls. And then what happens? Everybody grabs the oar and they start pulling together. They pull, they pull, they pull, fighting against the current, seeking to, to get away from certain disaster. 
The Christian experience is that. We are rowing against the current. There is certain disaster for those who do not know Christ. Everybody in the fellowship needs to pick up an oar and be busy faithfully every week. It would be a good thing for all of us to get to the end of life and stand before the Lord and to be bent over, breathing deeply, and saying, Lord, I gave it all. And he will reward that. If we saw somebody run a race, and then afterwards lose by two seconds, and then walk around and smile and say, oh, I could have won if I'd tried harder. Well, guess what? Your job is to try harder. Christian, it does not matter your age. It does not matter your life circumstances. You have been called to be a co-laborer, a co-worker in the ministry. Everywhere Paul went, he was quick to gather those and have them help him do the important work of the gospel. Letter B, God is faithful to provide, to provide funds. And he has been faithful. If you've been to our business meetings, you know that we have been talking now for some years about being able to renovate the FBT Center to make it not prettier so the world can see that, but to make it more effective for our ministries. And in our next business meeting, we'll have a report. And after that, we'll have some specially called business meetings to consider all of the findings that we have coming from those experts who have looked at the buildings. And we're going to need to learn what we do to study and to pray and then make decisions with our votes. It's really important for us to spend the Lord's money carefully. With your faithful giving and with those who are on our finance team and with our deacons who manage all of those funds, we are now in a position where we have about $300,000 of cash that we can invest in that building. I'm not sure what it will take. I don't know if that's beginning or if that will cover it. We'll let you know at those meetings. But this is what I want to say to you. You have been faithful in your giving. And God has been faithful through that to provide the resources that we need. There's nothing here to indicate that Paul was complaining. He was very thankful. He speaks of it in other places. He was very thankful for the opportunity to work, to provide the funds that the Lord needed for the work of the ministry. God is faithful to provide funds. Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Let her see. Talking about how God is faithful to his servants because he raises up godly co-workers. He provides the funds. And here it is. God is faithful to bring converts even in the face of opposition. Now, I've mentioned our programs that are happening during this school year. There are many other programs, but those are the ones that I highlighted for you. They are not successful because we've designed the perfect program. They are not having an influence because we have dynamic leadership involved in, the, in these ministries. What we're asking, those who are serving, what they are asking is, Lord, in this place, would you display your power? Would your Holy Spirit take the teachings of the Word of God and do something that is significant and eternal? That's what we're doing. We are asking God to do the work, even though we're going against the current. Here's how it was said, verse 6. But when they opposed and insulted him, speaking of the Jews, 
Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is upon your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul and became believers and were baptized. God is faithful to bring converts, even in the face of opposition. Letter D, God is faithful to encourage. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. This is one of the longest stays recorded in Paul's missionary journeys. He stayed there because God had opened a door. God was blessing him. God encouraged him with this special visitation. It's like this. You've seen it, haven't you? Watching basketball, I mean, we all love it. Don't you love it? When a coach calls a timeout at a critical point of the game and he brings his players over and he sits them on the bench and he has the water passed out and you can tell by the body language that he's saying, I want you to keep doing what you're doing. You're really looking good out there. You're really hustling. I could tell you were tired, so I called a timeout. I don't have any complaints. Catch your breath. Get a drink of water. And now let's go back out there and finish the game. Now, we don't see that very often. Oftentimes, when the timeout is called, the coach is turning various shades. He's yelling and screaming and throwing things down, and that's at any school. When you are working faithfully and when you are getting tired and discouraged, God will call a timeout, and when he does, he will say, I like the work you're doing. Keep it up. It doesn't matter how hard it is. Do not quit. And here's how he encouraged Paul. And I would suggest he would encourage you in the same way. The Lord encouraged Paul with his presence. The Lord ministered to him face to face. Now, that doesn't happen often in the Bible. But in this case, he encouraged Paul with his presence. He encouraged Paul with his protection. You keep doing the right thing, and I'm going to back you up. You keep doing the right thing, and I'm going to protect you. Because you are working with me in this ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of the gospel. And number three, the Lord encouraged Paul with his promise. What you're doing will count for eternity. There are people in this city who will believe. There are lives that will be changed. Eternity will be different because others will come to Christ because of the work that you're doing. God will encourage you when you faithfully determine to serve him. Letter E, God is faithful in spite of an apathetic government and hostile enemies. Perhaps we know something of the apathetic government. Other places in the world know a lot about the hostile enemies. Starting at verse 12, when Gallio became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accuse Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our laws. Just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, Listen, you Jews, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or serious crime, I would have a reason to accept your case. But since it is merely a question of words and names and your Jewish law, take care of it yourself. I refuse to judge such matters. 
He threw them out of the courtroom. The crowd gathered Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him right there in the courtroom. But Galileo, Galileo paid no attention. This was a very important court case. This would be like for us a Supreme Court ruling. This governor, having listened to it in a very influential place like Corinth, said, none of this is important to the government. This is a religious discussion. Let Paul go wherever he wants to go and let him preach whatever he wants to preach. By saying this, in essence, Paul had the backing of this governor, really the backing of the Roman government for a period of time during this important foundational period of establishing the church worldwide. The one who apparently was there to lead the rebellion, his people got so mad at him that they beat him right there at the place. God is faithful in spite of an apathetic government and hostile enemies to complete the work of the Great Commission. Number three, God's servants should be faithful in serving him in spite of difficulties. Many of us will be watching the Super Bowl later on today. And we're going to see these monster men. I mean, they're big. If you ever get down on the field and, and see them standing along their coaches or, or next to water boys or next to a reporter, and some of them are two or more feet taller, and even without their shoulder pads, they've got broad shoulders and big arms and and legs that are like tree trunks. I mean, these are powerful men. And this will be the most important game of their lifetime for many of them. And they will give everything. And we'll see some of them that get hurt in the meanwhile. And you'll watch every single one. will get himself back up as soon as he can. And he'll say, I'm all right. I'm all right. Don't take me out of the game. If they take him out of the game, he's going to lie every chance he gets to the trainers and the doctors because more than anything, he wants to get back in the game. He knows that is where he belongs. Any church, any of us, become discouraged when those around us quit the good work. When they say, I hurt too much, I'm too tired, I can't do it anymore. Now, I don't know that all of you should be there on a Wednesday night, because that's not your place. But you have a place. Somewhere in your service to your king, you have a place. You are called to serve. You serve by going, yes. You serve by giving, yes. You serve by praying, yes. But we are all called to serve. Paul's message is this. God's servants should be faithful in serving him in spite of difficulties. Here's why. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have given you all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And one of those verses that I love because of the encouragement it brings, Isaiah 43, 1 to 3. And now, Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says. It could easily be this. And now, Bruce, listen to the Lord who created you. Bruce, the one who formed you, says. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Woo! I mean, that's good news, isn't it? It doesn't get any better than that. 
The God of the universe knows me by name. He has redeemed me by the blood of his son. But notice what he says next. When you go through deep waters, not if, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. We must serve. Paul says, I have finished the course. And what he ran was an obstacle course. The highs and the lows, the abuse and the praise, it did not matter because Paul said, I will finish the course. I will not quit. If I fall down, I will get up. If I get tired, I'll take my breath, I'll drink my water, and then I will serve more. I will keep going until the Lord calls me home. Now, I'm not encouraging you to be exhausted. I'm not encouraging you to overload your schedule. I'm not saying that you ought to give more, more, more to the church and its ministry. Necessarily. But I am saying this. You are called to serve. It's expected that you will get tired. It's expected that you will be misused. It is expected that you will be underappreciated. But guess what? There is a day coming when the judgment of the King of Kings will make it known to all the universe what you did for his glory and in his power. What a great day that is. At the end of the game today, Those people who are exhausted and broken and bruised will have a feeling like very few people in the world have ever had. They will be the champions of the world in football. If they will condition and work and do all that for the praise of a few men for a few years, what must we do? for our King, the Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask you to consider those important words. Now, my wife probably thinks I'm done. Ha, ha. Little does she know. All right. Uh, Nyla's doing better, but if you'd continue to pray for Donna and uh, those who are up there seeking to minister, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, let's do that. Father, we're thankful for these words from Acts chapter 18, that tell us, they give us a snapshot of what was happening during this time, this important time of the spread of the gospel and the establishing of the church. Father, we're always encouraged by Paul's determination, by his willingness to give everything for the cause of Christ. Father, we're encouraged to do the same because of that example. Father, I'm asking that you would bless in every part of our ministry more than just those few things that were mentioned today. Lord, we want your presence. We want your power. We want your protection. We want your promise in every one of our ministries because we know what we're doing counts for eternity. People knowing Christ, that changes everything. So, Father, I'm asking that you would use us Father, I thank you for the many co-workers that are in this place, those that I have been privileged to serve with, those who have been strong when I've been weak, who have been determined when I have vacillated. Lord, I'm asking that you would make this place a display for your glory. We ask for that as we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here. Listen, we... uh, we salted and um, and sanded the walks, but there are going to be slippery spots, so be very careful. 
on your way out. Ladies, you know that when your shoes are warm, especially those dress shoes, they're extra slippy, slippery for a few steps. Be very, very careful. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.